Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first Will be last. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be back with you again this Sunday. I am Reverend Laura Guy, and uh, I am I'm so glad to be with you. When I was growing up, we rarely had desserts in the house. So on the rare occasion when we did have some leftover pie or birthday cake, my sister and I would argue over who was going to eat the last piece. To keep us from arguing, my mom decreed that we would have to split the last piece and share it. And to make sure that one child did not get a bigger slice than the other child, she had one of us cut the last piece, and then the other child got to choose their piece first. Anybody else have this rule in your household growing up? It's a genius parenting hack, right? Because the one who is slicing, who's dividing that last slice, is going to make sure that there is not one crumb on one piece more than the other because they know that their sibling is going to choose the bigger piece. It's a way to ensure that everything is fair. This was an important lesson in fairness in my childhood, and it has been deeply ingrained in me. But as an adult, one who is trying to understand who God is and how God loves, I've come to realize that my childhood notions of fairness are not always serving me well. In fact, my strong sense of fairness might actually be hindering my understanding of God. I've come to understand that fairness is not a biblical idea. Now, justice is something that God cares about a lot. We read a lot about justice in our scriptures, but fairness, especially as children would define it, is not really a biblical concept. In fact, the Bible is full of stories of people who don't get what they deserve, who don't get what is expected. In this parable we just heard, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, Jesus takes this idea of fairness, of what you and I think is fair, and he turns it 
upside down. Now, Jesus loves to turn things upside down. And if you look at his parables and look at what he says about the kingdom of God, often you're going to see that he has turned the things that we think or that we know on their head. That's what he's doing here in this story. A landowner needs workers to harvest grapes in his vineyard. So he goes to the marketplace early in the morning to look for the strongest and hardiest workers. These are the people that you and I would hire, right? If we had a vineyard and we needed people to harvest our grapes, we would hire those who looked like they were the strongest, the hardiest, who could put in a good day's work. We want to get our money's worth. So we would look for the people who look youngest and strongest. Now, all the workers in the marketplace are day laborers. They don't have what you and I would think of as steady jobs because there weren't really that kind of employment back in those days. There weren't steady jobs. But there was harvesting to be done throughout the year, and so the day laborers would gather in the marketplace and and the, the farmers, the landowners, would come and would hire people for the day to work in the fields. So these workers show up in the marketplace each morning, hoping that someone will hire them for the day. If not, then their family might likely go hungry that night. If they are not hired that day and and paid a day's wages, their family might not have anything to eat that night. There are still many people in America and around the world who live like this. It's sometimes known as living hand to mouth because people work and they get their their wages in their hand and then they have to go immediately buy food so that they can eat hand to mouth. So the landowner picks up a crew of hardy workers first thing in the morning, 6 a.m. And he promises them a denarius for a full day's work. Now the denarius was the going wage for a day's work. So what he's offering them is fair. It's expected. But a day's work was 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. A denarius is not a lot of money, but it's enough to buy food, to to feed your family, and maybe have a little bit left over to, to save up for a rainy day. So the first group goes to work, probably feeling grateful that they were hired that day, right? Landomer comes and says, I'll pay you for working today, and they are probably grateful. Great, I got work today, I can feed my family today, this is awesome. A few hours later, sorry, I lost my place there for a second. A few hours later, the landowner realizes that he has more work than the workers he's hired originally. So he goes back to the marketplace. It's now 9 a.m., and he hires another crew of workers, telling them that he will pay them a fair wage. We're not told what this fair wage is, but they're probably thinking, well, it's not going to be a full denarius because, you know, we didn't start working at 6 a.m., but it'll still be enough to buy food for my family tonight. These workers were probably not as young and strong as the first batch he hired that morning. They've been sitting around in the marketplace for another three hours, so they weren't snatched up by the employer's first thing, but they're still good, strong, hardy workers, and they go to work in the vineyard too. So now the landowner has two groups of workers in the vineyard. But around noon, he goes back into town and hires another group of workers. Now this group was probably about to give up hope of being hired for the day, right? The day is half gone. And who wants to hire somebody for half a day? I'm sure that's what they must have been thinking. And I suspect that this group of workers is maybe a little bit older, a little bit slower than the group that was hired first thing in the morning. But the landowner offers them work for half a day, and they, they jump at that opportunity. They're happy to know that they'll at least earn some money that day and be able to buy some food. 
And then around 3 p.m., we find our landowner once again going into town to hire yet another group of workers. This is a foolish thing to do. At this late hour of the day, all of the strong, hardy workers are gone. The folks who are left are the people who almost never get work. They're desperate, but they're still clinging to hope that someone might have some work for them to do, that they might earn something to be able to buy some morsel of food that night. The landowner hires them, and they too go to work in the vineyard. And then, the most shocking thing of all, the landowner returns at 5 p.m., and the, the workday ends at 6. And he hires yet another group of workers. Who do you suppose those people might be? They're the people that never get hired, right? They, they might have a disability. They might be old or feeble. These are the ones who must beg for food, or they will not be fed. But although it's almost quitting time, our landowner hires them. When the whistle blows at 6 p.m., the landowner tells his manager to gather all the workers and pay them their wages, but he wants them to be paid in reverse order of when they were hired. This is where the trouble begins. They are to be paid in front of all the other workers. The manager begins paying the people who were hired last, the ones who only worked one hour in the cool of the evening. And what are they paid? A denarius, a full day's wage. And this happens right in front of the tired and sweaty folks who put in 12 long, hot hours in the full sun. These workers who were hired first are not happy. And can any of us blame them? Wouldn't we feel the same way that they feel? There must be some mistake, they say. We have worked much longer and harder than anyone else here, and we deserve more money than what they're getting. And they're right. This is unfair. You can't give as much money to the people who showed up right before quitting time as you give to the folks who were there all day. When the single denarius is placed in the hands of those who worked the full 12-hour day, they are furious. Now remember in the morning when they were hired, how did they feel about receiving a denarius at the end of the day? Grateful? Happy? They knew they were going to get to feed their families that night? They had work for the day? But now, at the end of the day, when that denarius is put in their hands, how are they feeling? They're furious. They're furious. And all that has changed is that they saw what others were paid. It's the only thing that changed. When they complained to the owner, his response was simply, have I broken my agreement with you? Did I lie to you? Did I tell you I was going to pay you a denarius and not pay you a denarius? Well, well, no. No, that's not it. That's not the problem. Ah, says the landowner, the only difference is that now you see what the others are paid it did not seem unfair to you when you only knew what you would make. But my money is mine to do with as I please, is it not? Is it against the law for me to be generous with my own money? When I read this story, I can totally identify with the workers who were hired first. That sense of fairness kicks in, and nothing about this story is fair. Those who worked all day in the hot sun deserve more than 
those who showed up for one hour in the cool of the evening. And if any of us had been in that first group of workers hired, we would be angry too. That's just common sense. That's just fair that they should make more than the last ones hired. And I think when Jesus told this parable, he wanted us to feel it in our guts, like we do, right? I think he wanted to stir up that sense of unfairness and anger in us when we heard this parable. He wants us to have a visceral reaction, a gut reaction to this story. I think he wants us to be angry, and then he wants us to hear the words of the landowner. Can I not be generous? The landowner is not interested in fairness. He has kept his agreement with the workers who worked all day. He paid them what he promised them. But they only became unhappy when they saw what others were being paid. If they had not seen that, they would have received their denarius and gone home happy. The only thing that changed is that now they see what others are receiving. The landowner wanted them to see what others were receiving, perhaps so they could begin to understand generosity. The only thing that changed is the context of receiving their denarius. They were treated exactly the way they expected to be treated, paid a day's wages. But once they saw that others were also being paid that amount, their attitude changed. And their satisfaction they felt at being hired that morning took a nosedive. This is not a story of fairness, but it is a story of God's grace. And God's grace often doesn't make sense to us. God wants everyone's children to be fed that night. God wants everyone's children to be fed that night. So the landowner pays all the workers enough to feed their families. Think about the words we just prayed this morning in the Lord's Prayer. Give us This day, our daily bread. It doesn't say, give me this day my daily bread, and everyone else can figure out what they need for themselves. It's a communal prayer. Give us, your people, God, give us this day our daily bread. Give all of us enough to eat today. Daily. We also pray in that same Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In God's kingdom, does anyone go hungry? In 2008, my husband Cliff and I were fortunate enough to take a trip to Cape Town, South Africa, with a group from my seminary. This was an educational trip, but we also enjoyed the beauty of Cape Town. And one of the places we visited on that trip was a township called Masafumalele. You might know that townships were created during apartheid, this brutal policy of segregation and oppression of people based merely on the color of their skin. And the townships is where people of color were forced to move. And even after apartheid ended, many people chose to remain in the townships because they had built these communities in the townships. However, after decades of harsh treatment and oppression, these townships are still places of great poverty. As I said, we went there in 2008, and I was shocked to see that many of the homes where these people were living were 
literally made of cardboard walls or plastic tarps or a little bit of, of corrugated metal wherever they could find it. These homes were barely able to stand a strong wind. There was no grass, there's no yards. It's just little lean-tos or shacks, one after the other. Some of the homes actually are made of wood and a little sturdier, but much of it is built from scraps. There's no electricity, no running water. And we were told that the unemployment rate in that township, in Masafu Malele, was over 70%, 70% unemployment in that community. But those in this township who were strong and healthy were able to get work as day laborers. They would show up early in the morning and the vans would come from the different employers who needed day laborers and, and those who were strong and healthy would be chosen and they would fill up the vans and they would, vans would drive away and take them to go do a day's work. But every day the vans would drive off and there would still be people standing there waiting, hoping, praying that they might have been chosen to work that day. And they were not. But our tour guide who was leading us through the township was a woman who actually lived there. And she explained that when those day laborers returned in the evening, they would take their wages and they would go buy plenty of food and their families would cook it up and then they would deliver meals to their neighbors who did not have work that day. She said, in the township, everyone eats. In the township, everyone eats. This was the first time I had a real understanding of the African concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu comes from the Zulu language and is usually translated as, I am because we are. It's a sense of inner connectedness in all of our lives. One way it is expressed is in a popular greeting. If someone greets you, did you sleep well last night? The Ubuntu response is, I did if you did. So in other words, if your neighbor was troubled by something and was kept up tossing and turning all night, that also troubles our sleep. In Ubuntu, honor and admiration are not bestowed on those who accumulate the most money, but on those who give away the most money because it strengthens those bonds of connectedness. This parable of the workers in the vineyard looks like Ubuntu to me. The landowner hires everyone, even those who cannot do much work at all. And all are paid enough to feed their families. Everyone receives daily bread. As Christians, as people who seek to live in God's kingdom, who pray every week for God's kingdom to come to earth, maybe it's time we let go of this concept of fairness, especially as it relates to our own lives and what we receive, because it's only going to make us miserable. Every time we look around and see that someone else has a little bit more or has the same amount, for working less than we did. That only makes us miserable. Instead, let's seek to live in God's kingdom of grace, God's kingdom of generosity, an Ubuntu kingdom where all are fed. After all, this is how grace works. If we were given what we deserve, what was fair, could any of us sit at the table with Jesus? I couldn't. May we too be people of grace, of generosity, so that all might be fed. Amen.